Uh, it's a privilege to be before you today. Um, I don't take this lightly. I'm just, you know, old brother in the Lord who loves the Lord. And I'm walking this path that is set before us. And um, it's a long walk. You know, I've been walking with the Lord since um, 1983. Uh, it's, uh, I had my ups and downs, but, you know, God is good. Amen? One thing I've learned through my experience is that um, God is faithful. And his word is the surest thing you could rely upon. Nothing else is as firm and as sure as the word of God. And today, as we um, want to appreciate those who are leaders, leaders in ministry, you know, it's always good to appreciate those who work among you. The Bible says you must, we must know those who labor among us, right? But I want to put a flip on this. Um, it's good when we can appreciate our leaders, but it's even greater when the appreciation comes from God. When God looked down on our leaders and said, I'm well pleased. So today, um, I'm taking a message to be appreciated from on high. Now, I know pastors will appreciate all the appreciation, all the, the, the accolades and everything that we give to him from down here. But our main focus as pastors, as leaders, has to be, am I pleasing to the Lord? And that in itself is a challenge because when you have a leader, your life does, even as saints, our lives doesn't belong, it's not our own. We have been bought with a price, God's own us. But when you're a pastor, it's even worse. I think back to a few examples, which I don't have scriptural reference to, but um, men of God, where God told them to, that one is that I'm going to take away your wife, and you must not weep, because you're going to be an example of what's going to happen. There was another one, he said, go and marry a woman who is a harlot. These are things that people who are leaders have to go through, because guess what? Their lives are not their own. Their lives belong firstly to God and to the sheep that they shepherd. Because things that's going to happen, they're going to have to be able to take care of them. So if by perchance you're looking at your pastor and you know that they're going through things, don't automatically, don't automatically think that they sin in their lives. These things are happening because God knows down the road, there are going to be people who are going to need this same consolation whereby they were comforted. So God has to prepare them so that they can be a, one who could associate with what we are going through. So be careful how you view your leaders, the man of God, the people who lead you, because it's not always as it looks. James 3 and 1 says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. You see, when God calls us out to be leaders, call one or to be a leader, the level whereby God will judge them or hold them accountable is higher. Amen? Amen. Whereby, you know, God may wink at us as individuals who are followers or who are under the leadership of, of pastors and so forth, he might put up with things a little bit more. But when it comes to leaders, the, the impact of a leader is much more wider, whether positive or negative. And one thing I've learned by nature, and it's also a spiritual law, that nothing that is sold come back at the same level it was sold. You put one kernel into the ground, and you don't get back one kernel. You get back a whole set of corn. Amen? You do good, and it come back to you multiply. You do evil, and it come back to you multiply. But when it comes to leaders, it is stricter, because their in impact is on the whole congregation, those who God have put them to shepherd. Okay? Amen? Amen. Another thing, though, it's, this is a little scary. That's why, personally, I hope I'm not in rebellion, but... I've asked the Lord, please, if you know you don't mind, please don't put, call me into leadership. Because um, the things I see you do to your leaders, because he has the confidence. Remember, God is God. 
and God knows more about you than you know about yourself. The things that you think you cannot handle, God knows you can handle, and especially to leaders. You know, there was a man in the Bible, we all understood about Job, and God was so impressed with him that God actually invited the enemy to consider him. And you know the trial that Job went through. So, for our leaders, okay, not just in the church, but across the, the kingdom of God, God can at any time choose to put them to testing that will test them to the max. And sometimes they will fall. But guess what? The Bible says the righteous may fall seven times, but guess what? He doesn't stay down. He picks himself up. Amen? So, you know this of Job and what happened. Sometimes God will select a leader and cause him to go to a situation because he wants to prove to the enemy that he is able, amen, to keep that which was entrusted to him. Amen? And God wants you, the individual, to know that he does have that confidence in you. Once you stay under his umbrella. Because once God has his hands upon you, there is absolutely nothing that's impossible. Amen? So, leadership in the church is a high calling and is exposed to many challenges that may not be common to us as followers. Amen? Leaders go through things that we are sheltered from. Amen? It's like, they're almost like, if you see like an icebreaker, it goes through, they go through and they break, they make a path so that we can follow. We don't all, always have to make that initial breakthrough. They do it for us. Amen? And that's one of the calling. Second Corinthians 1, Second Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 7 reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and, and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the suffering of Christ abounds in us, so our consolation also abounds to Christ. That if we are afflicted, listen to this. This is for the congregation, okay? If we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for the enduring, for enduring the same suffering which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the suffering, so also will you will be partakers of the consolation. So you see, the pastors will have to go through sufferings on our behalf so that the consolation, the, 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 the things that God did for them, how God brought them through, they will have that confidence that they could tell you that it is well. What you're going through has an end. It too will come to pass because God have not only spoken it to them, but he have also allowed them to experience it. So that's why it's very important that we be in constant prayer for our leaders. The Bible does give us leaders after our liking. If we want to be sugar-coated and just have a nice time and just let everything just go easily, no pushback, no discipline, we will end up with those kind of leaders. But if you want to know the heart of God or want to walk in line with God, God will also give you that kind of leader. So when the leader approaches you, and rebukes you or corrects you, be humble. Because God will not bring something to your knowledge or to our knowledge that we are, ourselves do not know. Most of the time it's just a confirmation because guess what? The Spirit speaks to us. Amen? So, the thing that the pastors go through is not just for themselves, but it's for us that they could console us. Amen? Now, there are many ministries uh, in the church. Amen? Brother Mike um, read some of it before, Ephesians 4. I'm going to read from 4 to 16. I just want you to know this, this is a body, okay? And a body is one. If you look at your own body, it's just one. Amen? There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all 
and in you all. But to each of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower part of the earth. He who descended also is the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he may fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the working of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should be no longer children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speak the truth in love, may go up in all things to him who is the head, Christ, for whom the whole body join and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, cause growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Amen? So, it's a body. There are many ministries. Now, when I first got saved back in 83, 1983, I, um, it took me six months before I actually got to go to, where I was able to go to church. And in that time, I had a small little Gideon Bible that back home when you go to school, they give you the small New Testament with Psalms and Proverbs. And that's all I had. And Man, it was such a, oh, that, it was like food beyond imagination. In that short time of six months, I went to this New Testament about six times. I couldn't understand certain scriptures didn't, was close to me, like Hebrews, I didn't understand in Revelation. But for most of the other part, it was pretty good to me. And God showed me, you know, that his body, that he's coming back for in this latter day, it's going to be a glorious church without spot and wrinkle. Amen? But one thing I've noticed with God, we as man, we try to upgrade, we try to modify, and we try to change things so that, you know, we say, maybe this may not work. Let's try something differently. But with God, he's consistent. God never changes. And when God puts something in place, it is the best. Amen? You cannot add to it. You cannot make it better. So the best thing to do is just align yourself, see God as the potter, see ourselves as the clay, and allow him to form us in that which he wants us to be. Now, when it comes to his church, we know when Christ walked the earth, he, was, he embodied everything in himself. He had all the ministries within him. But after he ascended to heaven, he did not put those gifts in every individual. He dispersed it to different individuals. And for the structure of the church, he put, these are these five that I mentioned, and there are other scriptures where it speaks about other ministries. But I personally, from the scripture, it creates that some of the problems we're having in churches today is not so much because we may not love God or want to do the will of God or try to please God, but is that we have, don't you the ages have changed the structure? Now these days we have in my words, are supermen. We have very few people who are leading the church. Now, every ministry has a purpose. What I notice in the church is you have pastors, 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 and that's about it. But God says there must be the, 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 the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist. All these are important. It's like the body. If all the body was a head, how would the head get from point A to B? Mind you, the head is important, but still, if it doesn't have the other members to take it around, it's useless. Amen? Amen. So likewise, now, this is not a message just to this church. I'm talking to the body of Christ, because I know that Christ is coming back 
for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. I know the things that are happening, that happened in the old church, in the early church. He said the, the latter will be greater than the former. So these things are going to happen. But the people that are going to be partakers of this are the ones that align themselves with the will and the methods of God, not the way we want it to be done, but the way God decreed. Amen? Amen. So I'm calling to the churches to start praying, praying earnestly to God that he will fill the ministries, the churches with all the ministries. Because the Bible says when this happens, we come together as one. We will no longer be tossed to and fro with the cunning trickery of man. But we'll go into the perfect man. We'll come, come to the fullness of Jesus Christ. And we'll be able to withstand all the attacks of the enemy. But if we do it our way, we're going to leave cracks in the wall. Amen? And the enemy will be able to come in and do some damage. He still can overpower us totally. But he will be able to inflict us more. Amen? And this, at the age we're living in, things are going to happen. The church is going to be persecuted. It's just a matter of time. It's happening in other parts of the world. It's just a matter of time that it comes toward the front door. Amen? Now, now I want to... The fourth ministry we spoke in here was the pastor. And the Bible talks about a pastor as a shepherd. And that is very appropriate. Because if you understand shepherds, they actually are willing to put their lives on the line for their, 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 their sheep or their livestock. Amen? So therefore, we need to have an appreciation for them. Amen? Because the Bible did, in the Old Testament, it spoke about different, and in the New Testament as well, of, of shepherds who were not good and what happened to the sheep. They get scattered. Amen? So we need to show an appreciation for our leaders. And Sometimes people say it's understood. Oh, they know that we love and we appreciate them. But it's always good to verbalize it. Not just on this day, but as often as you have opportunity. Let them know that you appreciate them. Let them know that the work they're doing, that you appreciate what they're doing. And you know that it may not be easy, but you want to encourage them to keep on keeping on. Amen? Because if your leader fails... Guess what? It's going to have a great impact on you and all of us. Amen? That's why the enemy, he attacks the leadership. Because, you know, if he could, if he could um, cause damage to the leadership, he will affect the whole, the whole body. Amen? So we got to show appreciation, okay? We have to let them know that we love them, we highly admire them. No, we're not, I'm not talking about giving your pastors worship. Okay? But the Bible says, give honor to whom honor is due. Amen? We don't elevate them to become gods. I mean, there's some leaders who like that. They gloat in. They, they want to be called special names. They don't want to carry the Bible. They can't speak to anybody. You've got to make an appointment just to speak to them. I pray that our past will not become like this. Because Jesus Christ, he was among the people so much that the woman was able to touch the hem of his garment. Even when we look back in the Old Testament, with Elijah, I think it's Elijah, with he, with um, he saw when the when the when the the, 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 the lady came whose son had died, and she tried to hold on to his leg, and Gehazi said, tried to push her away, and Elijah said, leave her alone, because it's a practice. You protect your leaders. It is a practice, but Christ broke that. He allowed people to come unto him. Amen. There were times he had to separate himself from them, but that was just so he could speak to the massive. So. Sometimes you see he will get into a boat and he goes, because those people, they, they press into him. They so wanted to what he had to receive from him. But Christ always made himself available. And sometimes he even went into a compromising position. When I say compromising, thing that we will not do. He go to the home of a, um, a Pharisee who he know was not a godly person. He, if he, he'll go to places because, guess what? The light has to shine in the darkness. Amen. It's not that he's going there to be partaking fleshly behaviors. So if you see your pastor going to some, a place, I might think, that's a bit compromising. Should he be going there? You don't know why, why God is sending him there. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I heard stories of pastors going into bars 
and rescue people who was about to commit suicide. Why would a pastor go into a bar? Now, be careful. Don't use this as an excuse to go into bars, to feed the flesh, say, I'm doing the work of the Lord. No, you got to make sure it's the Lord who is calling you to that. Because if not, you can destroy yourself and you could cause others to go astray. Amen? So it's important. Amen? So we got to show them appreciation. Amen? Let the pastors know that we really appreciate them. And we hold them in high esteem. Because the work they do is a... <sighs> and a lot of us, we think about presidents and leaders of islands and nations and so forth. But let me tell you something. The calling of a pastor is higher than that. You may think, ha, what are you talking about? These people have millions of people who they, they govern, the Lord over, they, who so, uh, the subjects. But they're doing something that is temporal. A pastor work is eternal. The impact will not just for this age, but the age to come. Amen? So don't ever demean your pastor. Think that he's just, oh, just one of us, just another person. You know, I know like when royalty come into pe oh, most people's presence, like the queens, the king, the president, everything, people honor them. They behave themselves. They don't do things that are not, you know, they don't think that are disruptive, right? But you notice when the man of God comes up here and he starts to minister, sometimes we disrespect them and we get up and we go all about the place. And we, 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 sometimes it's difficult when you minister in the word and there's distraction. It takes your mind off of what the Spirit is saying to you. But we have to learn to appreciate and honor our leaders. Amen? Amen. I would like to give a story, speak a story about, um, this was something I experienced in my own life. Um, they're going to come to the time when a pastor is going to have to discipline us. You know, the Bible said, no discipline for the moment seemed to be pleasurable, but in the end it yields the, the, the fruits of righteousness. When you get a child and that child disbe misbehave, you can't just wink at it and let that child go. You have to discipline that child. Now, I will counsel you, don't discipline the child when you're angry. Because then you could lose control and you could hurt. You could abuse that child. Discipline the child when you are in a calm spirit. Because guess what? It's going to hurt you more than you're going to hurt them. And that will help you to control the discipline. But it has to be done. Amen? When I was growing up, I was small, so I, I didn't have this responsibility. But my older brothers, they had the job of, moving the livestock, the cattle from one point to another point. And there was these few days where there was this one cow that they forgot they didn't go to move that cow. Couple days, and that cow was on a chain, so it, could, it was restricted where it could go. And that cow made a perfect circle of dirt around it. It ate all the grass it could find, every inch. It was a perfect circle around it. And you could see the, 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 the ribs were starting to show to his body. When my father discovered what had happened, my brothers, hey, <laughs> what happened to them? The discipline that inflict upon them, guess what? That thing didn't repeat itself. Sitting for them wasn't easy after, because he dealt with them severely. And sometimes, God will put us through painful situations. Like, there's a story told of a sheep that always stray away from the, the shepherd. So what the shepherd did, he broke one of the sheep's legs and put it in splints and carried it around his neck. And when he read it for feet, he put it down. When that leg was fully healed, that sheep was so accustomed to being so close to the shepherd that it no longer went astray. It always was a sheep closest to the shepherd. And sometimes... God may have to break a leg also on us. And he will do that through the pastor sometimes to bring us closer that we could minister. And sometimes it may not be a physical break. It may be, it may be a sickness or situation whereby you need the counsel of the pastor almost on a daily basis. When, it, when, it, when everything is said and done, when you're restored, you will learn not to take the, the pastor for granted. Amen? 
Amen. Now, I'm going to try to do too much to this because we don't have much time. But there are, two, there, are, there are pastors who are good and there are pastors that are not so good. Now, our ultimate pastor, our shepherd, is the Lord himself. I call him the shepherd of shepherds. I know the 23rd Psalm, how he speaks about him, right? Now, that's a position that will not be fulfilled by a man on this earth. Amen? But it's an example of what a shepherd should be like. But other than that, there are shepherds who will lead the body of Christ. Amen? Down here on earth. Um, just when Moses was about to to depart, when his, his, his work was finished, and he had finished his course, and he was going to pass the baton on to Joshua. He was very concerned about the sheep. And in Numbers 27, 15 to 17, he, this was the, the prayer of Moses, the, the request of Moses to God. He said, Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, Lord, and said, let, he, said, he spoke to the Lord, saying, let the Lord, the God of the spirit of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, who may go out before them and go in before them, who may lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep which have no shepherd. You see, when one shepherd finishes his course, he wants to pass it on. He wants the work to continue. Amen? So that's an example of a good shepherd. Another one is in Isaiah 40 and 11. He said, a good shepherd, he said, he, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lamb with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Amen? This, is, this talks about God and also about a good shepherd. Amen? They will care for the young. They will care for those who are feeble, those who are need assistance. Amen? John 10, 7 to 16, read about a good shepherd. He said, Then Jesus said, to them again, most assuredly I said to you, I am the door of the sheep, and all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go, go in and out and find pasture. Then he goes on to say, the thief comes except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling. And does not care about the sheep. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And I know my sheep. And, my sh and I'm known by my own. Now, this was Jesus speaking. But also, when a shepherd is truly called by God, they will show forth the same example as Christ did. They will actually put themselves in arm's length for the sheep. They will protect the sheep. They will not allow them to be scattered. The difference between a good shepherd and a bad shepherd is that the bad shepherd cares about themselves. They don't value the sheep. They allow them to be scattered, but they focus on themselves. Amen? I'm not going to read the scripture that relates to the bad shepherd, but there's quite a few. On your time, you could read um, Isaiah 56, 10 to 12. That's Isaiah chapter 56. Verses 10 through 12. Also, Jeremiah 23, 1 to 4. You don't have to put these up. Jeremiah 50 and 6. Ezekiel 34, 1 to 10. That is a few examples of things that happens to shepherds when they're not faithful to God. Amen? But I want to come down to why we're here today. Now, I said we want God to honor us, but, you know, we also need to honor and respect those who have leadership over us. Amen? 1 Timothy 5 and 1 reads, Do not rebuke an elder, but exhort him as a father, younger as a brother. This is important. 
This is not just only talking about pastors, but also elders, people are leaders. We got to respect headship. Amen? God works on headship. Tim, 1 Timothy 5 and 17 to 21 reads, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle the, an ox while it treads the, the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. He says, Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. He said, those who are sinning, rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest may fail. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice and doing nothing in partiality. Now, I want to draw on two points here. The first point is, he said, they are worthy of double honor, especially those who live in the word. And I know Brother Mike shared that, um, you know, if you have a gift for the pastor, you know, it's not, it's not uncalled for. It's not like out of character to, to give the leaders, you know, financially or with some other way of, of, of honoring them. The Bible said they are worthy of double honor. Amen? So that's giving as well. So we know they may have their regular salary or whatever, but sometimes you just want to bless the, the leaders in your midst. Amen? Just give them some kind of gift. So today, if you have a gift for them, it's okay. It's not ungodly. Amen? And a pastor doesn't strive on gifts. He's not going to want to try to get you guys to keep on giving him gifts. He probably will reject it if he could, but, you know, he, he don't want to take your blessing away, so he'll allow you to give him the gift. So if you want to be blessed, bless the man of God. Amen? And you will receive a blessing in return. Amen? Amen. Now, it also says something that is very strange. I've heard pastors speak about, touch not the Lord's anointing and do his prophet no harm. But in that statement, it speaks about First, the prophet, which are the leaders, and it also speaks about his congregation. It's not just, you know, just saying, touch not the Lord's anointed and do, do your prophets no harm. There's the prophet and then the anointed ones. We are all the anointed ones. The Bible says we have an unction from the Holy Spirit, and we need that no one teach us because that anointing will teach us. When we come to church, you see, we don't really come to church for the pastor to um, reveal things to us only, but it's a confirmation. God deals with us. And the word that he get, the spirit quickened it towards our understanding. It cannot be head knowledge. It got to be heart knowledge, spiritually enlightened, revela revelation. Amen? So, there might come a time when the pastor might err. It's not, we see David, he did. Didn't David err? He messed up, right? And the prophet had to come and speak to him. Amen? And David was ready to bring down judgment. But then he realized that um, the, the prophet said, you are the man. So, but if ever the pastor may slip, please, in the spirit of meekness and confirm, make sure what you don't think, make sure you know what you're saying, approach him in meekness and speak to him. Nobody is above reproach. The Bible says, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. Amen. I'm going to wrap it now because I think I should be, I think I'm going to pass my time. But um, I just want us to honor our leaders. Pray for them constantly. Pray for them constantly because the enemy has a bullseye on your leaders. And if he could, if he could take them down, if he could cause them to fall, it will impact the body. Amen? So today... Let us pray for our leaders, for our pastors, and that, that God will give them the wisdom and the knowledge to lead us in a way that is pleasing to God. That when God can look down at them and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen? Because it's not, the, 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 it's not necessarily the magnitude of the calling that's important, but it's the faithfulness. Amen? I want to thank you for giving me this listening ear. Continue, please, to pray for the leaders here, and not just for our leaders, but leaders across the kingdom of God, because the church is suffering a lot of things because we have leaders who are self-focused and not thinking about the kingdom. Let us pray and stand behind our leaders 
And if they, if they need correcting, do so in the manner that is pleasing to God. Amen? They're not above reproach. Amen? I want to thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Audio jump.